Today, I'm very thankful to the planning committee and also the directors of the program for the opportunity to just share a little bit on nutrition therapy and cerebral palsy. I have no disclosures. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, some different methods for assessing nutritional status, and we're going to explore energy, protein, fluid, and micronutrient needs. We'll also be looking at some of the gastrointestinal issues that these children face. And then finally, we'll focus on some strategies to correct these disorders and, of course, to improve nutritional status. All right, so our problem. Well, CP is associated with the presence of feeding disorders in 60% of the affected children. And so there's subsequent undernutrition reported in 46%. And so there are consequences of this undernutrition. There could be decreased cerebral function or decreased immune function, or the circulation time can be decreased. And that could be important if our patient has uh, pressure sores that need healing. We also see decreased respiratory muscle strength and undernutrition. And of course, micronutrient deficiencies as well as growth failure. So I know we talked about this earlier today, but I'll just mention this in light of energy needs, because we know that some of these uh, types of CP, some of these patients require more calories than others, such as with spastic CP and then the athetoid. So we definitely pay attention to that when we are making our assessment. And we also looked at this uh, earlier today, and I mention it because we know that in these children with at the higher levels, um, they, they have more feeding issues, and so we need to be cognizant of that. In my research, I ran across this article by the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. And from henceforth, I will call it ESPGAN, just to keep it brief. And they came up with guidelines uh, for the evaluation and treatment of GI and nutritional complications in this patient population. They convened in uh, 2015 and they did a literature um, search of the past 25 years of literature. And their goal or their aim was to come up with practices uh, that would guide people in taking care of these nutritional uh, and GI complications in this patient population. So what we wanna know is how to best manage nutritional status in neurologically impaired children. And th this work group, this ESPGAN work group, they mention in their guidelines, actually this is the first one, the first guideline, it suggests that nutritional evaluation and management should be performed by a multidisciplinary team, ide ideally including, as required, a physician, dietitian, nurse, speech therapist, physical therapist, psychologist, and occupational therapist. And of course, that that's, ideal because then everybody, we get to see all the different perspectives and expertise that comes into play that can help our patients have the best outcomes. So we know in this population, we at times, uh, we have nutritional risk factors and it could be related to inadequate intake. Maybe they have uh, feeding or swallowing problems like oral motor dysfunction or poor lip closure, or even dysphagia. So other things that could happen with inadequate intake is just because they are um, unable to express themselves. Maybe they're nonverbal, so they can't say that they're hungry. They have to rely on their caregiver for feeding. Other risk factors include uh, gastrointestinal problems like emesis or reflux, or even constipation. And then also energy expenditure. Uh, we know that with, as I mentioned earlier, with certain types of CP, we have increased energy needs. So we take that into consideration as well. So there's a lot of uh, methods to assess nutritional status, and we're going to look at a few. Anthropometrics, body comp, body status, bone status assessment, as well as lab parameters. 
So anthropometrics, I know this seems very basic, I know, but getting an accurate weight is so important because a lot of us base much of what we do on a patient's weight. So uh, we're fortunate in our outpatient clinics to have wheelchair scales on every floor. And we also have a sitting scale. And then uh, other things that could be used are hoist scales to get this weight measurement. Now for height measurements, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, if a patient is able to stand, of course, we measure that way. And if they can lie straight, then I have a six foot ruler that I can use to measure their length. But if they aren't able to lie straight, and we know that this happens many times with our patients that have contractures or spasticity or scoliosis, then we have to take in, we have to do alternate measures to get their height. And one of these is the knee height uh, that you could get. And there's a picture there that you see. And this requires special equipment. You have to have a knee height caliper and you can measure that and then you can compare it to these knee high equations, depending on your patient, and then come up with uh, their height. Another uh, measurement that you could do is a tibial length. And this one's nice because it doesn't require any special equipment other than a measuring tape. So you have them seated or in the supine position and then have them cross their right leg over their left leg above the knee and then you can measure from the crease of the inner knee down to the bottom edge of the inner ankle and then plug it into the equation you see there. So that's one that can also be done and it's, it's pretty easy. Other ways are the ulnar length or the arm span. So we, we like doing that because you can, it's nice to have that instead of always relying on a parent's reported length. Now we also look at body composition and skin fold thickness is one way to do that. And you only need to have a caliper to do that. And we know that with a tricep skin fold of less than 10th percentile, that's an indicator of low body fat and undernutrition. So we can measure these uh, skin folds and you can uh, plug it into calculations on uh, sites like PD tools and so forth to see where your patient falls in the percentiles and z-scores. And then you could, there's the CP-specific Gurkha equation. That one is, uh, has correction factors built into it uh, that you can use in this population. We also look at bone status because of course, bone, low bone mineralization is a problem. And that could be because of limited ambulation or feeding difficulty. Maybe they've had previous fractures or anti-convulsant use. And one of the guidelines that ESPGAN work group recommends is the use of DEXA scans to measure bone mineral density as part of the nutritional assessment. So with bone health, uh, we know that rickets is rare, but fracture rate is high. And so some of our nutrition strategies uh, is to give vitamin D and we, for the ones that are in the uh, GMFCS four or five, they need the 800 to 1000 IU per day of vitamin D. And recognize, we also recognize that tube feeding might not provide 100% of the RDI for vitamins and minerals, particularly if the patient is um, on the higher end of the weight for age scale or their, or their BMI is high, then they might be on a low calorie tube feeding. And then to meet their protein needs, to meet their needs, they might, or their vitamin and mineral needs, they might need to have additional. We also look at lab parameters and uh, albumin and prealbumin, they're not reliable in this population. Uh, because it's rarely a protein issue, but more of a calorie issue. And we also look at nutrient deficiencies. Uh, these are recommended to be checked annually. Things like iron, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D. 
So we have the anthrop anthropometrics, you know, we have the weight, the height, and so forth, and we can put them onto a growth chart. But what growth chart, growth chart should we use? There are special charts for patients with cerebral palsy, but um, we know that this, these growth charts showed how children were growing, not necessarily how they should be growing. And ESPGAN uh, recommends the use of uh, growth charts for typically developed children to assess our patients with CP. So as far as assessment goes, there are certain things we look at. Of course, fluid is one of them. And it's to maintain the hydration for our patient because they're at risk for dehydration. And the reason for that is that they might be unable to communicate their thirst or it could be drooling or they have excess losses or maybe they have an unsafe swallow. And so they're not drinking as much fluid as they would if they could, if they could swallow well. And so maintenance needs, we can calculate. Uh, one method is the holiday Seeger method. And I've put the chart there. And it's just recognizing that even though we calculate a figure, then sometimes uh, our kids won't be able to tolerate that amount, whether it's a, a fluid issue, uh, you know, being able to take in that much fluid or hold that much fluid, they might need to uh, get by on a little bit less than what we calculate. And of course, energy calculation is part of it. And there are different methods we could use in the article with ESPGAN. We, they mentioned the Schofield method, as well as the chart here that you see. And there's a couple calculations on here that we can do. We can do one with the VEE, or we could do uh, calculations based on their uh, centimeters of height, and that's popular as well. Or if you happen to have a metabolic cart lying around, you could do indirect calorimetry. But of course, it's much more, it's much simpler and less expensive to do a calculation and then simply adjust up or down depending on your patient. So if they need more, give more calories. And if they are gaining too much weight, then you can decrease that. Because at times we have issues with overnutrition as well as undernutrition. Protein needs, uh, we found that uh, they recommend in the guidelines that they're similar to the needs of unaffected children so that the DRIs are what's recommended to be used. And of course, if a patient does have pressure sores, then we can give additional protein. And if they're, or if they're very undernourished, we could do so as well. We also look at micronutrient requirements. And so we know that that can happen as well. And we use the DRIs for these as well. Now, after assessment, we think about some of the issues that these children may have. And some of them are the gastrointestinal issues like dysphagia or oral motor dysfunction or constipation, or maybe they have uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So we'll look at that a little bit. Now, when we're looking at oral motor dysfunction, there's, we can either watch a feeding and see what we observe, or we can ask questions of the parent to see if there's any issues that may be happening. So we can ask them, are they do they have frequent pneumonia? Or are they having coughing or choking during their meals? Or does it, their airway sound noisy or wet? Or do, are their eyes watering when they're feeding? So you can ask different questions to see if you think that there is an issue. And of course, speech therapists could definitely aid in the assessment and treatment of this. And then if we suspect that something is not working properly, then we can get a video fluoroscopy or we call it a modified barium swallow study to see if there's any abnormal swallowing or aspiration, silent aspiration, so that we know whether it's safe for our patient to eat. Other GI issue that comes up is 
reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And the prevalence of this is about 50 to 75% in children with neurological impairment. And the reason being multiple reasons, low tone, scoliosis, spasticity, or even positioning can have an effect on this. And the complications of GERD are esophagitis, uh, aspiration, dysphagia, uh, ending in undernourished, or undernourished. And of course, there are different treatments for it and pharmacological treatment uh, being one of the first lines. And that would be things like acid reducing agents such as PPIs and then uh, other treatments per gastroenterology. And then surgical treatments are also an option as well with a Nissen or a small bowel feeding or a gastrojejunostomy. So nutritional stat strategies to help with uh, GERD could be a decreased volume. So if your patient is eating, one thing that can be done to help with that is to decrease the amount of food that they're eating at a meal. So maybe they're going to eat six smaller meals or several smaller meals instead of three larger ones. Or if there are two feeding, then they can get uh, smaller boluses during the day if you make up the volume in a nighttime feeding. So you can manipulate their feedings in that way. You could also try a protein hydrolysate formula or um, some with MCT that could improve emptying. And then thickening of formulas could also be tried or trying a whey based formula. And then of course, positioning would help too. Constipation and neurological impairment. Well, we know there are multiple causes of it and it could be from excessive fluid loss, or perhaps they're just not getting enough fluid overall, or it could be related to their medication. We heard about baclofen earlier and constipation. So the treatment for this constipation is the same as for unaffected or children that are not disabled. And it could start with laxatives like polyethylene glycol or Miralax or it could even be enemas if needed. And then just avoiding mineral oil if there's a, a possibility of aspiration. Now, nutritional strategies for constipation, one is to in increase fiber, but just remember not to go too much too fast because that can cause gas or bloating and discomfort. So we can increase it, but do so gradually. And then adding some extra water into it in, can really help with constipation. Now, if you have a patient or a child that's eating and you wanna increase the uh, energy content of their food or drinks, then you can do a high calorie diet at, or you could add little things that have small uh, or small things that have big calories in them. You could also give supplement drinks like commercially pre prepared products, or you could do powdered supplements like protein or fat and carbohydrate, modular supplements that can help improve intake. You can also try, um, maybe they need something that's thickened, that would help or perhaps they need a different kind of texture. So you can modify the texture of their diet to help at times. But even with all that, at times we get to the point where there's undernutrition. And this SPGAN work group, they suggest the use of one or more of the following red flag warning signs to, to identify undernutrition in these children. And for instance, they mention a weight for age Z-score of less than two, or again, the tricep skin fold of less than 10th percentile, or mid upper arm fat or muscle area less than 10th percentile, or if they have faltering weight or failure to thrive, or any other physical signs of undernutrition, such as um, pressure sores and poor circulation. So, if a patient had one of these 
red flag warning signs, then it would be worth looking at to see if they did or if they were undernourished or not. So at times we get to the point where we have to think about uh, tube feeding. So when should we consider it? Well, of course, if our patient is not able to meet their needs orally, then that would be a time to do so. Or if they're unable to eat safely, maybe they can eat, but they shouldn't be eating because they're silently aspirating. So we definitely wanna think about tube feeding at that point. Or if, if they are expending three hours or more a day uh, with feedings, then that's another example of when to consider it because that's too long to be spending on eating. So the, uh, what we like to do is start conversations early with families so that we can bring up this subject uh, before it becomes an urgent need so that they have time to consider uh, tube feeding and what it would mean to their family. So if, if a patient were not getting everything that they needed and suddenly they get enteral nutrition and they're doing well, they're gonna have improved growth and nutritional status and their hydration is gonna be better and their bowel function. And the, it also makes it easier to administer medication because you now have that tube to use. And lastly, but certainly not least importantly, is that it decreases the stress on the caregiver. A lot of times parents really are encouraging their kids to eat and they're spending a lot of effort and energy doing that. And it can be a struggle at times to, to get the child to eat what needs to be eaten in order to grow well. And so giving a tube feeding can alleviate some of that pressure on the parent to encourage the child to eat more than they are able to. And they can still enjoy eating food, but now they have the tube feeding that is meeting their needs. So the takeaways uh, are that nutritional complications, well, we know they're common in children with CP and Approaching nutritional management as part of a multidisciplinary team is ideal. And there are guidelines that we can use to aid our practice, like I was talking about with the ESPAGAN guidelines. And then um, children with CP and good nutritional status have better outcomes. So they avoid all of the pitfalls of that being undernourished. So at this time, I will take any questions. Thank you, Robin, for that talk about nutrition. It was very enlightening for me and I'm sure everybody else. Does anybody have any questions for Robin or um, uh, Brittany? So I have a question for Robin. Robin, this is Dr. Puri. Um, so Robin, uh, you know, one of the problems we encounter sometimes in children that are um, more severely impaired uh, you know, they have CP, they are wheelchair bound, uh, they are not mobile necessarily, uh, is that <coughs> the parents feel that my child's doing okay, uh, why are you trying to fatten my child up? And everybody's bent out of shape about the fact that the child is, you know, looks a little malnourished and things like that. Your numbers might look okay, so your albumin's fine, your things are okay. The child is growing in length, but uh, you know, not uh, gaining as much weight as one might like. Uh, sort of, you know, what is uh, your retort to that, or how do you then address that, you know, issue? I mean, from my standpoint, uh, and I may be completely wrong about it, is that but what is the advantage of trying to do that? What is one trying to achieve in that case? I think it depends on where they are weight-wise uh, on, on their stature, where, what does it look like? What's the picture look like? Of course, we don't want our kids to be on the heavier side because then that makes everything more difficult. So we're not trying to fatten them up, so to speak, but we don't want them to be malnourished either. So we're just kind of looking at the, 
the picture to see how where they fall on that growth chart, what it looks like with our skin fold, and we want them to be adequately nourished, but not over nourished. And so with these kids, especially kids in wheelchairs, we might not like them to be on the, the side of this, the growth chart that we might be comfortable with kids that aren't in a wheelchair. For instance, on the 85th percentile, we wouldn't want our child to be up at that level. We'd like it to be a little lower than that. Thank you.